Okay, we back in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Specifically, we are in the area of Wilson Avenue, dubbed Drill Sun by some, or Product Avenue. Two other known avenues intersect here, Gates Avenue and DeKalb Avenue. So, here's another story on how another crew would land themselves in jail. The charges stem from a long-term investigation that began in March 2015 and was conducted by the New York Metropolitan Safe Streets Task Force, which is comprised of, among others, special agents from the Federal Bureau of Investigation and detectives from the New York City Police Department. The money flowed by the millions from the lucrative heroin distribution chain. Pete and other defendants had direct contacts with a Mexican cartel and would routinely receive shipments of dozens of kilograms of heroin. The significant quantities of heroin would frequently require the transportation of hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash across the country, from New York to Los Angeles and elsewhere. As is common with large-scale lucrative drug trafficking operations, its members regularly carried firearms. During the period of the charged racketeering conspiracy, law enforcement seized nearly a million dollars of the crew's drug proceeds, over 20 kilograms of heroin, multiple kilograms of fentanyl, and an impressive fleet of exotic cars, all amassed by the crew from their heroin trafficking operation. Social media postings show members of the crew at nightclubs, wearing diamond-encrusted jewelry, and with their cars, which have included a Lamborghini Huracan, Rolls-Royce Ghost, Mercedes CLS 63, a Bentley, Mercedes S550, Porsche Cayenne, Range Rover Sport, BMW M4, and Maserati, vehicles that retail for as much as a quarter of a million dollars. Other evidence of how the defendant spent drug proceeds included a $3,000 Versace stroller, a $20,000 Audemars Piguet watch, and tens of thousands of dollars worth of jewelry. And the defendant spared no money traveling abroad on vacations, including to Cancun, Matengo Bay, Punta Cana, and Costa Rica, they also traveled to Miami, where they rented luxury homes and yachts. As this court accurately remarked in one of the hearings, the display of wealth in this case has been impressive by any standard. One of the leaders of the crew, Pete, for years, enjoyed the lifestyle that came with the business. Of the fleet of cars associated with the crew, the Rolls-Royce Ghost, the Mercedes CLS 63 and Audi R8, Spider belonged to Pete. Additionally, Pete purchased a Porsche Cayenne for his mother. Other members of the crew, many of whom have been convicted, and some sentenced, for violent crimes, including murders, served as enforcers for the money-making drug distribution operation, using any violence the crew deemed necessary, including enforcement and collecting drug debt, shootings, and killings. Many of these defendants were members of Violent Street Gang, the Young Gunners, or the YGs. This set of the YGs was called, the Frontline Gunners. They once had a beef with another crew, the Splash Gang, a battle between the light and dark side in the area. Anyway, some members would become enforcers, and they armed themselves with guns to protect and escort the head drug traffickers of the crew. Pete was, along with others, one of the leaders of the crew's drug trafficking operation. As such, he was one of the dudes who had direct contact with the Mexican cartel, with Pete personally making trips to Mexico to conduct business meetings. Pete also helped with the transportation of the money and heroin. For example, in December 2011, he rented a vehicle for his cousin, co-defendant Felipe, to transport approximately $311,000 to Chicago, where it was supposed to be exchanged for kilograms of heroin. After Philip was stopped by a state trooper in Ohio and the money was seized, Pete dispatched counsel for the crew to defend Medina and to try to recover the money. Pete even reviewed Philip's perjurious affidavit and encouraged him to submit it. In April 2012, law enforcement stopped Pete with $100,000 after investigators intercepted wiretap conversations about heroin. Although Pete primarily relied on others for enforcement as he focused on leading the heroin operation, like Lou, he possessed firearms and participated in some of the crew's violent acts. For example, in April 2012, Pete and Lou, assisting another member of the crew with a dispute with a rival street gang, returned to the vicinity of the dispute for a confrontation, resulting in Pete shooting an innocent 10-year-old bystander. The boy was not Pete's target and was wounded after Pete fired into a crowd, the boy survived. Additionally, at a New Year's Eve party in 2013, defendant Miguel Pantojas shot an individual after that person had a dispute with Lou. A few months before this, another Bushwick crew member, Ty Maka, would be involved in a murder. During trial, he would plead guilty to this murder. Ty Maka wasn't charged until 2018, but here's what he said. 
On August 18, 2012, within the Eastern District of New York, a large fight involving multiple people occurred inside a bodega and spilled out onto the street. I was not involved in the fight and did not know the reason why they were fighting. I also did not know all the people involved. I did, however, know some of the people involved, including a Bushwick crew member. I was drinking alcohol nearby with some friends. I ran over to where the brawl was taking place. As I approached the fight, I pulled out a gun I had been carrying previously throughout the day. I was carrying the gun in an attempt to gain recognition and entrance into the Bushwick crew. There was a large crowd fighting when I arrived. As I approached, a figure from the crowd who was actively fighting at the time lunged in my direction. Spontaneously and with no intention to kill the individual, I fired the gun I was holding in the direction of the person lunging towards me in the crowd. I fired the gun once. Prior to the shooting I had never met Daunt Williams and knew nothing about him. I was not fighting with him on the day of the shooting. I did not intend to kill him. However, by firing my gun in his direction, I did not care whether or not grievous harm would result. And since that day, I later found out he died from the gun wound caused by my shot. There is not a day that goes by that I do not think about what I did, and I'm so sorry for my actions. That was Taimuk's part. This next situation is crazy, and the type of thing you see in the movies. Besides, movies depict real life sometime, right? Before we detail the events, let's talk about a member who was involved, Spaz. Although he and other enforcers occasionally distributed heroin much like the drug traffickers, Spaz's role in the crew was primarily to act an enforcer for the money-making drug distribution operation, collect and enforce drug debts, and retaliate against any rivals or anyone who was perceived to have disrespected the crew. He was also present for the murder of Don Williams, but on March 5, 2013, things get more deadly. That day, two men, Gary Lopez and Rudy Superville, would attempt a robbery. They went to the apartment of one of the Bushwick crew's main heroin distributors, Bebo. At the time, there was approximately one kilogram of heroin and over $150,000 in cash inside Bebo's house. After entering Bebo's house, Lopez ordered Bebo down at gunpoint. Bebo, whose girlfriend was asleep in another room, offered the assailants money, they asked for the drugs, and Lopez struck Bebo in the head with a gun. Lopez and Superville then attempted to restrain Bebo with zip ties. It was likely that Lopez and Superville would have murdered Bebo and his girlfriend. Bebo managed to avoid restraint and grabbed a gun from the kitchen and shot them both. As the victims remained wounded in Bebo's home, members of the crew, Spaz, Lou, Miguel Pantojas and Jason Pantojas met at the apartment to torture and ultimately kill the victims, they then disposed of the bodies. While alive, the victims were badly beaten. For example, upon his arrival, Spaz saw that Gary Lopez had been wounded and restrained. So, he stomped on him and others followed suit. As he was fighting for his life, Gary Lopez managed to call 911 and can be heard pleading for help during the recorded conversation. Shortly thereafter, Spaz, unprompted by anyone else in the crew, fired the fatal shot into Gary Lopez's body, which killed him almost instantly. During the beatings, Superville attempted to flee. Several of the defendants chased Superville, beat him and kicked his head into a wall. To conceal the murders, some of the crew members, including Spaz, left to buy cleaning supplies to get rid of Deanna evidence. When they returned, the Pantojas brothers poured a combination of ammonia and bleach on the victims. At some point during this process, Superville's body twitched, and he made a noise. In response, Jason Pantojas grabbed a knife and repeatedly stabbed Superville to death. Pete and Lou, among others, drove to a construction site to get barrels into which they thought they could stuff the bodies, but by the time they returned, rigor mortis had set in, and the bodies could not fit in the barrels. The crew members then loaded the bodies of the victims into a van, and, when it got dark, drove the van to a remote area, where they lit the bodies on fire. Several members of the crew participated in the cleanup efforts at Bebo's home, including disposing of clothing and cleaning blood and other physical evidence, they also helped each other hide from law enforcement. Lopez, who previously spent three years in prison for robbery, was carrying $10,000 in cash the day he was killed because he planned to buy a new car, relatives said. Superville, Lopez's childhood friend, previously spent five years in prison for robbery and assault, according to state records. Now one perspective as to what happened was that Bebo knew that they were going to attempt to rob him. Not sure how true that is, but one thing we can say is that Superville was once aligned with some of these guys. 
He was YG2 at a point, based on this picture. There may have been some type of fallout, starting in and around late 2012 or early 2013. That's just speculation, and it could have just been the opportunity sought out by Superville and Lopez. Either way, that was just some background on the double murder. In May 2013, New Jersey local law enforcement recovered almost $20,000, a press machine for processing kilograms of heroin and other paraphernalia from a stash house. The stash house belonged to Pete and another leader in the organization, Lou. In the ensuing years, until their arrests in this case, members of the crew continued to crisscross the country with hundreds of thousands of dollars to purchase heroin. Along with Pete, Lou personally made trips to Mexico to meet with the cartel. He also took part in the transportation of heroin and drug money. For example, in June 2014, Pennsylvania troopers stopped a car with Lou's name on the title, registered to his wife and sister of Pete, Clarissa. The car was being driven by his own sister, Zida and her husband, Enrique, both co-defendants. Pete was involved in his sister's, Clarissa's, attempt to reclaim approximately $300,000 in narcotics proceeds that was seized in the car stop. Text message correspondence revealed that Pete advised his sister that the lawyer could tell the judge that this money wasn't caught in any criminal act and that they shouldn't have to ask for any proof or any criminal-related questions because of their assuming. Pete went on to advise his sister to tell the lawyer representing her in connection with a forfeiture proceeding that money wasn't caught in a raid next to drugs or weapons, neither did it get linked to any violent crimes. So that was a search because of stereotype, and we know they stereotyped because they didn't issue a summons for the original cause of the stop, which was tailgating. Ask the lawyer if he can mention those two points. Having sentenced Clarissa for her role in the operation, the court was aware that she testified falsely in a deposition that the hundreds of thousands of dollars recovered from the vehicle represented her savings from working as a dancer, which was not true. That seizure did not dissuade Peter the crew in continuing its nationwide heroin trafficking. Less than a year later, Indiana law enforcement officers recovered $48,000 from a hidden compartment in a car driven by Lou's uncle and his uncle's wife. Lou was in another car right behind them, driving in tandem. During the car stop, Lou denied knowing about the money in the trap, but his text messages with Clarissa demonstrated otherwise. Specifically, Clarissa texted Lou, don't answer nothing, you don't got to say nothing, and watch what you say. They going to confuse you Louie. You could bury yourself talking. An hour later, Clarissa texted her husband again to instruct him to delete everything, to which he readily agreed. Additionally, on August 31, 2017, FBI agents and NYPD officers executed a judicially authorized search warrant at Lou's residence, where Lou resided with Clarissa and two children. In addition to numerous luxury goods, including designer purses and shoes, law enforcement agents recovered from the residence a money counter, used to count the proceeds of narcotics trafficking. The money counter seized from Lou's residence is consistent in appearance, with a money counter prominently featured in videos and photographs recovered from a phone. A search of the money counter, pursuant to a search warrant, revealed that the machine had counted 85,411 pieces, approximating to more than $1.7 million. That was assuming the pieces counted were $20 bills. Go figure. Other members of the crew similarly participated in drug dealing, violent acts involving firearms, shootings, and murders. Ty Goon was another member of the crew who primarily acted as an enforcer. He was also involved in the crew's heroin distribution operation, which he carried out while possessing firearms. Ty Goon murdered Johnson on September 20, 2014, in front of a nightclub in Queens. He and other crew members went partying at a club, driving Bebo's Jeep, which was equipped with a hidden compartment. Bebo was one of the high-level heroin distributors in the crew, to whom Ty Goon served as an enforcer for. A scuffle developed inside the club spilled outdoors. During the altercation, Ty Goon, along with Bebo, went to Bebo's jeep to retrieve a firearm, and, as Bebo was fist-fighting with one man, another man came toward Bebo. Ty Goon subsequently fired his gun towards the crowd, striking Johnson once in the stomach. Days later, Johnson succumbed to his injuries. Ty Goon was first arrested in 2009 for a serious weapons violation possessing a loaded semi-automatic pistol with a folding knife. Even back then Ty Goon was already a member of a gang, albeit a different one. Before he could be sentenced for the firearm offense, Ty Goon was arrested for possessing 32 baggies of crack cocaine. 
Tai Goon then brushed off the relatively significant sentence of 42 months on the weapons charge and one year on the narcotics charge, both imposed in 2010, by committing the instant murder in 2014, just two years after he was released from jail and while he was on parole. Two years after the murder at the nightclub, Tai Goon shot a semi-automatic pistol at a club, this time a strip club, and again, during an altercation. Tai Goon received a five-year sentence for that offense. Jay Gunner was another member indicted for his role in the racketeering conspiracy, heroin distribution conspiracy, and using firearms. One of the predicate offenses was the commission of a June 17, 2016 armed robbery of a barbershop customer. It was broad daylight, while patrons were getting haircuts. There is not much else to say here as far as these guys go, at least in this story. There were other members who committed their own crimes that we didn't talk about. We will get to that soon. Those mentioned and not mentioned are facing a whole lot of time in prison. Some say that the crew is in disarray due to some members going to the feds. Maybe maybe it had something to do with their testimonies. This about wraps it up for this one though, and as always, stay low and thanks for watching.